What more do we learn about John the Baptist in Luke? That's what we're going to find out in Luke 3. We saw the beautiful Christmas story inside of Luke. What a good writer he is. I think that's one of the most amazing things, too, is how good he is at writing. He just captures that whole night. For all times, when people look at the gospel of Christmas, they always think of Luke. Mark is quick. Matthew is prophecy and has the Magi, which is also a nice addition. But Luke, boy, Luke just has it all. So right now it says that we're in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. So Caesar Augustus, he's gone. Tiberius is his adopted son. Pontius Pilate is now the governor of Judea. And Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee is in charge of the area. And Philip is the Tetrarch of other regions outside of the area. But basically, the surviving sons, because Herod was known to kill a child or two of his own, were ruling in that area. But they weren't allowed, like Herod was, to be called king of the Jews. I get the idea from reading about it. Two of his sons ended up getting exiled by the Romans. One of them got sent to France, which doesn't sound like a bad exile, to be honest. But they didn't do a very good job. And what we have now is the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Everyone believed that Annas was Caiaphas's son. And so they both were ruling together in the Sanhedrin. So they're going to be part of that 77. He's going to be the chief priest. And it said that the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And that's when he went out into the region, to the Jordan River. It's beautiful there. I'd go to the Jordan River and proclaim a baptism of repentance for forgiving of sins, as it was written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. And the very last scriptures would have been in that Malachi, Ezra, Joel, Nehemiah. Nehemiah is probably the latest book that comes close, and that was about 420 BC, if we think that Jesus was born somewhere around 4 BC. So they believe, you know, there's the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then there's this 400-ish year gap. What I came to realize in reading the other Gospels and the commentaries is John the Baptist, he's the last of the Old Testament. He is still an Old Testament prophet. People waited for Elijah to come back and announce the Messiah to everybody. This is what John the Baptist is doing. And it wasn't Elijah coming back himself, but the spirit of Elijah, you know, the, the kind of prophet Elijah was. That's who John was. And so it said, when the word of God came to him, he went out into the region of the Jordan. His parents were very old. And so while Mary is still alive with with Jesus, his parents were much older. They were most likely were not among us anymore. But you know what? They were the people, Zechariah and Elizabeth, from the proper family that could give John this proper education of what the word of God meant. And also we can gather from this history piece and what we'll know from the other parts of the Bible. Tiberius Caesar was known for his cruelty. You know, Augustus had his cruelties for sure, but he was considered to be among the best of the Roman leaders that he brought himself from Octavian, the name Octavian, to Augustus. He was going to be a level up. He was going to be august and sage and wise. And there was something called the Pax Romana, that he was bringing peace to the whole world. Not really the whole world, but he was bringing peace to his empire because he was such a wise leader. Sadly, Tiberius was not that same kind of guy. Pontius Pilate also seems to have some dedication. You don't get to be governor by being just a horrible leader, but you also don't get sent to the backwaters of Israel by being that great either. But he was known for massacres of Jewish people as well. But he did have a sense of law, and we see that when we see the end of each Gospels and we hear from Pilate talking to Jesus. And then again, the Herod's children, which was Herod, Philip, and Lysanias. Not as good as their father as well, but just as cruel and petty as he was in almost every way. So John comes out saying, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his path. That's what we do for kings. We make their path straight. If this was a king that was visiting our countryside, 
We would take the rocks out of the road. We would widen the road. We'd smooth it out. We are going to make everything easy for the king to come here. It says that every valley should be filled and the mountains and hills made low, and every crooked part shall be became straight, and every rough place shall be made level. We're going to go to every extent possible to make our way for the Lord as easy as possible, so that it says, quote, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Obviously, they don't flatten the mountains, but you get the idea. We're going to do everything we can to prepare for this coming Lord Jesus. We have more words in Luke, which is nice. He says that he told the crowds that came out to be baptized by him. So he must have had quite a following. And I mentioned in the other Gospels, his following lasted for some 200 years after his death. He had people following him. As all good prophets of Israel, people listened to him. And he told people the truth, but he said, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You know, he's talking to the crowd. And whenever we see that brood of vipers, we know he's meaning the Pharisees. He knows that he had visitors, crowds of people that were both people earnestly trying to come to him for baptism. But, you know, there were some of those guys in the back of the area going, "Uh uh-huh, look what he's doing, look what he's doing. And he mentions it right here. These are messages we're going to hear from Jesus. Because who who are you to come to flee? Bear fruits, keeping with repentance. Jesus is going to talk a lot about bearing fruits. Don't say to yourselves, and I like this the last time we heard it too, well, we have Abraham as our father. You know, we're going to rest on our laurels of our gene pool, of our family history, and saying we have God on our side because Abraham is our father. And he says, you know what? God can take all these stones. Jordan is a river, so it's going to have lots of stones and raise them up to be more children of Abraham. He wants children of Abraham. He can create them anytime he wants. You are not special because of your father because of Abraham being in your lineage. And then he says, the ax is laid at the root. We got more of this description in Matthew, because any tree that doesn't have good fruit, we're going to hear this a lot again, is going to be chopped down and thrown into the fire. You know, when you have the ax laid at the root, you know, the time has come. So then the crowd are like, well, dude, what should we do? And so he says that And this is more. I think this is not in any of the other Gospels. When you have two tunics, share with one who has none. Whoever has food, do the same. The tax collectors, he said, also came to be baptized by him. We're going to see more tax collectors come to Jesus as well. And they were like, well, what should we do? And he's like, don't collect more taxes than you have to because they were notorious thieves. So you came to me and you owed, you know, a denarius. I'd say, oh, well, it looks like to me you owe two denarius. I'd keep one and I'd give one to the tax authority. Don't do that. Just collect the taxes you're supposed to. Don't rip people off. Then the soldiers were like, well, what should we do? And he said to them, don't extort money or threaten people with false accusations. Just be happy with what you're getting paid. Be honest about your job. So he's not telling these people, which the Pharisees probably would, you're disreputable. Your soldiers, your tax collectors, get away. He's not saying any of that. He's saying, do your job and do it ethically. Do it the way it's supposed to be done and just collect what you're supposed to collect. This is an ethics-based lesson here. This is a message of being kind to those who are not in power. We're going to learn more about this when we talk about the Beatitudes, but when it comes to the poor, it also means the poor in spirit. But there's like a third meeting. I was just listening to something that was interesting, saying that the poor are people who don't have control over their situation. So the poor can also be in someone who's trapped. They don't have representation. They don't have any power to do anything about their lives. In this case, it's not just the crowd who's poor, but in some ways, these people who are considered to be outside of civilization, they're poor too. Because no one will talk to them. No one will represent them because they're considered to be outcasts. So then it said that they were questioning in their hearts with John. 
and wondered if he might be the Christ. Maybe John's the Messiah. And John kept saying, look, I'm going to baptize you with water. And there's someone who's coming, who's better than I am. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. But here we go again, the winnowing fork. That's what we're going to stick into hay, I think, and then separate out the wheat from the chaff is right at hand. And the threshing floor, that's where we're going to separate the wheat and the chaff. It's right here. And he's going to gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff, the, the leftover stuff, the stuff that's not worth it, is going to be thrown into the unquenchable fire. This is coming at hand. So I'm not the Messiah. He's coming soon. And so many people, he preached to the good news. There it is, the gospel to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, that's going to be Herod Antipas, had been reproved by him. So John said mean things to him because he took his brother's wife. And all the evil things that said that Herod did, because Herod was an evil person, So John told him the truth about this, about all the evil things he had done. And so then eventually he gets locked up in prison. And it's a little less majestic here, but it says when all the people were baptized and Jesus had been baptized and was praying, the heavens opened. We saw this in Matthew. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, not in exactly as a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We generally agree that nobody heard this except for Jesus because we saw how afraid they were when they did hear it for real in the transfiguration. And we get to some of the genealogy of Jesus. And I'm not going to read it all. Obviously, hopefully you're reading along with me. But we can see that this one's a little bit different than the one we saw in Matthew. It says that Jesus began about the age of 30. So we suspect this is somewhere in the 26, 27 AD realm. Being the son, it says, of Joseph, not his real son, but this one is going backwards in time. We saw how the Matthew genealogy went forward in time because, again, we're fulfilling prophecy. He goes a little bit backward. He goes a little bit backwards, and he goes back and say he's the son of Heli, the son of Matat, the son of Levi. I'm not going to read them all. And it keeps going back and back. But then we start seeing names we know like Amos and Nahum. So these are people we have heard of and we'll see and get to the Old Testament. Simeon, who is the son of Judah, who was the son of Joseph, who we will get to as well. David, who was the son of Jesse. Boaz, these are all people we're going to get to and we know about them. But we're going backwards in time to where we hit Shem, Noah, Seth, who is the son of Adam. And Adam, well, he's the son of God. We go all the way back through genealogy. We mentioned before that these genealogies are somewhat important because they put Jesus in a place and a time. This is not just Jesus popped out of in the middle of the blue and became Messiah. This is something that has been planned from the very beginning begotten from the very moment when sin entered the world. And it said even before that, Jesus goes all the way back. And all these things that we're going to read about in the Old Testament, people who are great and people who are not so great, are listed in this group of people. They're all part of the story of Jesus all the way back. Other people feel that this one's a little bit different because in Matthew it appears to be the genealogy of Joseph. People wonder if this is a little bit different because this is actually Mary's genealogy as well. So it's not just Joseph, it's also Mary, which means that at a certain point, they were part of the same family, but not in a weird way. But just in history, obviously, we are all part of each other's family at some point. So so that's why this genealogy is a little bit different. How John the Baptist is not just what I think the image of him is, a crazy preacher in the wilderness. He's knowledgeable. He's been educated. He was telling people what to do. He was instructing them on how to live and making sure that people had ethics in their careers, that people gave to the poor. And again, 
the message of repentance is the important part. It says, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. What does repent mean? It means think again. Go back. Change your behavior. I think the word is metanoia. Think again. I'm going to meditate on John the Baptist more and how instrumental he was as the last prophet of the Old Testament. What I'm going to pray about is that idea of making that pathway clear for Jesus now. Shouldn't we be the voice crying out in the wilderness? Shouldn't we be preparing the way so that everyone has an easy, straight path to visit their Lord? As we tell them, we're going to make every crook in the road smooth so they can get to see the real Jesus. And what I'm going to share with others is that concept of Jesus being a man in history, not just someone who came up and was a surprise, not someone who shockingly turned the Bible into a different direction, but instead, from the very beginning, the plan of Jesus was in place through all these people, good and bad, famous and not famous, women and men. The path was in play for this day where Jesus was going to confront the structures of power in his time and to be the redemption of us all when it comes to the price we need to pay for sin. Hi, right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. Please remember the Bible in small steps.com is the website for this podcast. And if you're looking to listen to any of the podcasts, you missed them. If you know someone who might want to listen to this podcast but doesn't have a podcast app, all the podcast articles are there in order. And you can listen to them and go through them and listen to them right on the website. You don't even need a podcast app. I'm also on YouTube and the links are in the show notes. So whatever way you want to listen, I hope that you can listen. And I hope that you're studying along. I haven't said this in a while. And I hope you listen in any way you want to. 